Listen only mode. Welcome to this webinar with Pet Safety Crusader Denise Fleck on pet safety and disaster preparedness for your senior dog. I'm Jenny Kashnick, president of the Gray Muzzle Organization. We provide grants to animal shelters and rescues all around the country for senior dog programs. You can learn more about us at graymuzzle.org. Denise Fleck will be presenting this webinar today. She is on the Gray Muzzle Advisory Board. She is a, the Pet Safety Crusader. Her specialty is pet first aid and CPR training for pets. She's authored many books, including Autumn and Winter of Your Pet. She has children's books, dog and cat first aid books, and a brand new one that just came out, The Pet Safety Crusader's Guide to Pet Disaster, Pet Paw Paredness, <laughs> and it's available on Amazon. And you can visit Denise's website at sunnydoginc.com for more information about her work, her books, or to contact her. She'll be presenting this webinar for about 45 minutes, and um, um, I'm recording it, and it'll be on the Gray Muzzle um, website. So, Denise, let's get started. Welcome. Thank you so much, Jenny. And not only am I delighted to be on the advisory board of the Gray Muzzle Organization, I'm really happy to be able to share this important information with all of you so that you can help your pet in the event of a disaster. When disaster strikes, it's up to you to allow it to become a life and death situation or just a major inconvenience. Your pets need you to be prepared and training, equipment, attitude, and experience can truly make the difference. When emergencies happen, only about 10 to 15 percent of us react appropriately. 75 percent of us don't do too bad of a job as long as we have somebody in the know that tells us precisely what to do. But we don't always have that luxury of having a team leader or somebody that's keeping their calm and having all the knowledge and experience. So it's important that each of us do get the training and are prepared. Then there's that other 10 to 15 percent that just totally um, get wigged out and don't react appropriately. Where do you fit into this scenario? I hope over the next 45 minutes or so you're going to be well on your way to being in the 10 to 15 percent who act appropriately and can save your life and that of a pet. The most powerful tools you can have, in my opinion, are readiness, positive mental attitude, and curiosity. Readiness basically is having supplies on hand and training yourself ahead of time to do various things, whether it's human and pet first aid and CPR, any kind of survival training, and just knowing how to do odd things, as well as having supplies on hand. So that's something you can certainly prepare for, and we're going to be talking about that more in this webinar. Positive mental attitude, however, is something that just kind of really can't be taught. It needs to come from within. Um, one of the best ways, I think, though, that you can create a positive mental attitude is by being ready. If you're trained to handle situations and you have the supplies you need, it increases your confidence. And with confidence, you obviously have a better attitude because you feel more assured that you're going to be able to handle the situation. Curiosity, um, for my third bullet point there, may sound like an odd one, but what I mean is just throughout your life, keep on learning for the sake of your pets, for the sake of yourself. When something pops up, check it out, or at least you know, put it on a list of things that you're going to research when you have a moment to check into it. You'll be amazed how, you know, just it's, it's kind of like when we read a book and you don't know a word and you look up the definition. Um, you'll be amazed how this can increase your skill set and knowledge if, you know, throughout your life you're just constantly trying to learn things. Um, you know how when you talk to your dog, sometimes he'll kind of give you that head tilt like he's trying to understand what's going on, kind of the, er, I'm doing it with my head, but I know you guys can't see me today. But um, that's the kind of thing. Just stay curious throughout your life, and when something, you know, doesn't compute, take the time to learn what it is. For instance, a very, very simple um, task, or I should say um, exercise here, is look at this common household item, a paper clip. 
just real quickly, can you guys write down 10 ways that you can use a paper clip? I'm not going to take a lot of time and give you this chance right now, but I'm just going to kind of throw this at you that besides using it to clip papers together or money, obviously it could be a money holder too, um, you can use it to scratch initials or a message into something. You can um, untwine it and reconfigure it and make it into a hook to hang something. You could, if you're really clever, make it into a compass or a sundial. You can use it to poke a hole into anything, to then put a string through and hang something else. You can use the tip of it to clean out the nozzle on a spray bottle that gets clogged or to open up um, a bottle of glue. So, I mean, there really are a lot of things and ways you can use this. And the reason it's important is sometimes if you're, um, one of the things I always say about first aid for pets is that you always have to do the best with what you have. And, you know, sometimes when we're in an emergency, we're not going to have all the luxury of things we really want and need, so we're going to have to improvise. And here's a great quote by Theodore Roosevelt, do what you can with what you have where you are. And when emergency strikes, that might just be the situation you are in. When disaster strikes, are you prepared to help your pet? I just want you to think about that. If the knock comes and you have 30 minutes to evacuate, can you gather all your pets? Do you have enough carriers? Are they wearing ID? If your kitty escapes, do you have a current photo? Or what about your senior dog? Are you allowing enough extra time to get him settled and out of the house? These are the things I want to talk to you about today. Now we're going to also, though, discuss um, some specific tips because depending where you're planted on this earth, there might be certain types of disasters that strike, um, you know, particular to your region. But do realize a disaster doesn't have to be regional. It can be just on your street or even confined to just your home where a fire could break out or a water pipe um, could break and your family, including your four-legged um, senior pet, might either have to hunker down at home or evacuate quickly. What if you aren't home, though? Because as much as well prepared as many of us are, we work or we do other things throughout the day, and our dogs have to stay home with it, you know, without us. So, um, do you have designated caregivers that can evacuate your pet if the fireman, for instance, won't let you back up your street or you can't get to them quickly? So, um, just as another tease, or a couple other things I'm going to be talking about in this webinar are having a wallet card and a pet alert sticker. So here we go. Here are the facts. Almost 320 million humans um, cohabitate in the United States. 380 plus million pets in the same locale. Um, so that's more than one pet per person. And you can see the breakdown by just a few cities I picked out here. Um, you can see at the bottom, PetSmart Charities has a formula, one dog for every four residents. So if you know the population of your city, you can get a good idea of how many animals might be there and might need help in the event of an emergency. 68% of all U.S. households have a pet. So that means Quite a bit more than half of us are going to be faced with having to evacuate animals as well as people. And uh, you're going to get tired of me saying this, but I'm going to say it numerous times today. If it's not safe for you, it's not safe for your pet. So take your dogs with you. People lost their lives in Katrina because they were told to leave their animals behind. They were actually forced to leave animals behind, but fortunately things have changed. And because of this, tens of thousands of animals became homeless or perished. Since then, though, when polls have been taken, 61% say that they would refuse to evacuate if they couldn't take their pets with them. And I know that sounds encouraging. However, 61% is only a little over of half the number of people that has pe have pets. So I really hope that statistic will increase in days and weeks and months and years to come because I hope 100% of us will all refuse to evacuate if we can't take our pets and we'll figure out another way um, to keep us all safe. It's not safe for you. It's not safe for your pet. And do remember, our senior friends are going to require a little more time evacuating. We're going to have to be a little more careful. We can't just quickly, you know, 
shove a, a senior dog into a crate because he might have arthritis or other health conditions. Um, he's going to certainly be picking up on our vibe, so it's so important for us to stay calm and just make the best of the situation for us and our canine best friends. We already plan ahead for a lot of emergencies. I mean, we have fire alarms in buildings. Hopefully you have a smoke alarm and a carbon monoxide alarm in your house, maybe several of them. You take out insurance policies. So these are all ways we prepare for something that may not go right. We also get into the car and we have airbags and we cross our hearts by putting that seat belt on. Being the pet safety crusader, I am absolutely going to say that I hope you put your pet in a seat belt too, or securely strap him into the carrier and have that carrier attached to a seat as well. Because a small dog in a carrier, um, even during a braking incident, that whole carrier and pet can become a projectile and get badly injured and you know hit you in the head or um, you know really cause damage to both you and the pet. So it's important with bigger dogs that we have them in a body harness. We never attach an animal in a moving vehicle to a neck collar, but we just need to always practice safety first. Should there be an accident while we're traveling and the pet isn't restrained in any fashion, um, when windows get broken and car doors get thrown open, the pet can very easily hop out of the car onto a freeway or a superhighway and then be hit by another vehicle. So keeping them restrained in the car is just smart all around for their safety and ours as well. Now if any of you were Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, you probably grew up with that motto, be prepared. And I pr honestly think it's a motto we should carry into our adult lives even after our scouting days. Um, being prepared really is just smart business. Although it's difficult to teach someone not to get stressed out, but by being prepared, we can lessen the panic that sets in when the worst happens. So, you know, like I often say in my classes, I don't teach yoga or meditation. I'm not going to get you into a Zen zone. But if you, you know, learn some skills and you have the tools at hand that you need, hopefully that will lessen your, your drama and your trauma and you'll feel more confident to react. Just going to show you a few heartwarming and heartbreaking pictures here of um, emergencies that have happened in the past and how you know we and our pets have had to get through it together. Katrina in 2005 in New Orleans. Dogs that were less left loose to fend for themselves. A cat that was rescued. Uh, a poor horse that looks like he was tied to a fence and you know nobody released him. The temporary animal shelters that were set up to you know, make a place for these pets to be safe until their owners were reunited with them once again. After Katrina came Hurricane Sandy, and there have been several more that have followed since. Out here where I am in Southern California, there are fires, and we've had them since 2007 and 2009. We've had them as recently as a few weeks ago. My yard was covered in ash. So these things keep on happening. Personally, I've been fortunate enough um, to train with a lot of animals. And depending on what other kind of best friends your senior dog may have in the family, whether it's a horse or a cat or other dogs, it's important you know how to evacuate them all. Here I'm um, practicing getting a horse into a trailer and working with some livestock. So all creatures, hoofed, furred, or feathered, need to be evacuated too. And very often when we um, take in a senior dog as a loving member of our family, we're the kind of people that have other animals as well. So you need to prepare for every family member, two-legged, four-legged, finned, furred, scaled, and so on. There were tornadoes, and I'm afraid to say there will be more to come. There's flooding that was just going on in Louisiana, um, Texas. Here's a, an animal shelter where the water came up quite high and the animals needed to be moved out. So I'm just showing you that it can be different types of emergencies that happen. So it's important, or I should say it's imperative, um, that we all know what's most likely to happen in our region and we're prepared for that. I happen to be a big Beatles fan, and as John Lennon wrote, once wrote in a song, Life is what happens while you make other plans. And you know what? There's always going to be something, so we need to be ready. 
don't ever think it's not going to happen to you because life has a funny way of proving us wrong. One of the good things, though, that did come out of Katrina was the PETS Act, the Pets Evacuation and Transportation Standard Act, which required local and state emergency preparedness plans to be put into place for pets and service animals. So that was 10 years ago now. So cities should all have an emergency plan in place. I was very honored. I actually um, received Volunteer of the Year Award from my local Burbank Police Department because I created the draft plan for the city of Burbank in California as far as its animal emergency plan goes. But you know, you need to check with your city because even though this has been put into place, um, every place hasn't done it yet. So you want to make sure where you learn, live, they have a plan. And a plan, whether it's for your family or for your city or your state, it needs to be flexible because d disasters just don't happen according to any plan. Things change from moment to moment. If it's a fire, for instance, and the wind changes direction, your evacuation route may no longer be accessible. So realize um, you know, we need to have that flexibility. The good news is that the people that have created family plans 65% of them include their pets. But actually, I'm not sure how great of good news that is because, once again, 65% is only a little more than half. We all need to really make sure that we include our pets in our plans. And to be honest with you, the people I hang with, I think more of them are um, plan, have preparations, I should say, for their pets than they do for their humans. But it's important we plan for ourselves, too. Um, but I also encourage you to get other people on board and your neighbors and your friends because if they don't have their own emergency supplies, um, they're going to kind of be a burden on your own time and your supplies if you're having to help them or having to give from your stash to them. So the more you can do to help each other get prepared, um, the less of a burden it will be on each of us and we'll all survive the um, disaster hopefully. Here are just some statistics that you can look at at your leisure. Um, it may or may not apply to you, but it just shows you who is more likely to already have their ducks in a row, so to speak. And you'll see it's people that generally have to fend more for themselves, that live in the rural areas. So you city folk, um, make sure that you start getting prepared, because if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. I don't care how cliche it sounds, it is true. So, what are we going to do? And there's my little dog friend with the head tilt, um, you know, just trying to figure out what it is we're saying and what we need to do. When disaster strikes, I'm going to tell you to hug a tree, and you're all going to look at me and go, what? But what I mean is when something happens, even if it's just a little emergency in your house, or you see that the dog has cut his paw, or he's limping, or something isn't quite right, stop for a moment. Take a deep breath and regroup. Um, what often happens, it's called acute stress reaction, but we literally get an adrenaline dump when we kind of panic or freak out when an emergency happens. And literally, our brains and our bodies don't work too well. So it's kind of like always, you know, before you walk across the street, you're supposed to stop and look in both directions. Well, when emergency happens, stop, take a breath, hug a tree, do something just to collect yourself and your thoughts and then go ahead and proceed with a good plan of action. And your action plan is really as easy as one, two, three. You need to be prepared, which includes having an alert sticker, designating caregivers for your senior pet and any other pets in your household, and developing knowledge and skills before you need them. You also need to create an evacuation plan. And not just write it down, have all family members involved and make sure they know the plan and that you actually practice the drill. And then number three, you gotta, you got to get some stuff to stash. And that's what I refer to as your paw preparedness kit. So let's talk about some of the preparedness. And one is to have a pet alert sticker on your front door or near a front window. 
This just lets um, first responders, which in some cases could be firemen, but you know we know the firemen's first duty is to us humans, but more likely animal control officers, animal response team members, people that are trained and ready to um, evacuate animals, um, they're the ones that if they see these stickers and you aren't home, they can go in and rescue your pets. So it's a great idea to have one of these visible near your, you know, like I said, front entryway specifying how many animals you have and your emergency contact numbers so they, they know how to get a hold of you um, and let you know where they have taken your pets. What I do want to encourage you to do though is if you are home at the time of emergency strikes to evacuate with your pets and cross out this sticker or remove it if it'll come off easily just so that those first responders aren't wasting time looking for pets that you already have with you. The other component of this, besides having a, um, a pet alert sticker, is to have a wallet card. But before you can even do that, and I explain that, what you need are designated caregivers. This may be your pet sitter. This may be your across the street or next door neighbor who you've exchanged keys with and who knows your pets and maybe you know their pets so that if one of you are home and the other isn't, you can take care of them. But do find, and I recommend at least three people to have on board that can look after your pets, that can evacuate them, and take care of them in your absence. They shouldn't be people that have never met your pets. They should actually be people that see your pets regularly so that your um, senior dog and any other critters in your household are comfortable with them. Um, but what you do once these people are on board, don't ever surprise somebody by just putting down their name and phone number and not telling them, but make sure they're on board. And then just create a little wallet card that goes by your driver's license that just says the effect that, you know, in a case of an emergency, my pets are home alone, please alert this person. Um, I actually make cards that look like this. If you're, you'll see on the bottom right the um, arrows pointing to one. If you're reading this, I'm in trouble. My pets are alone and I need help. Please contact my pet caregivers and their names and phone numbers. I know everybody's going to have one special person they want to look after their pets, but it's always good to have that plan B and that plan C if for some reason that caregiver is, you know, in an emergency themselves with animals or, you know, something, you know, for some reason they can't get to your pets. So it's always good to have that information. And even when it isn't an emergency on a regional scale, it's a perfect thing to have one of these in your wallet because I don't want to be Debbie Downer, even though my name isn't Debbie here, but you know, we can all be caught in a, a, a car accident. And it's possible that we're whisked off to a hospital and who knows, we may have oxygen or other tubes in our mouths, we can't talk. And especially if we live home alone with our pets, um, if we're not able to communicate to anybody that pets are home, that you know, senior dog who might be having a bladder problem and needs extra walks or who may need medication will not be taken care of. So by having a card like this by our driver's license, it you know doubles or triples the chances because somebody's going to look for our driver's license when we're admitted to a hospital that um, our pet will be taken care of and that the caregiver will be called just so that um, we have that peace of mind that while we're trying to recuperate, we don't have to be worrying about our pet as well. So this is what I was referring to with that designated caregiver. And it could be your pet sitter who doesn't live you know, necessarily on your street, but develop a buddy system or have that pet um, sitter available. Somebody, though, that you know, knows how to get into your house and knows your pet. And you know, again, it might be somebody that you reciprocate and do the same for if they can't get home to help their pet. You know, sometimes we only need this because we're stuck in traffic um, or we're working late and we need somebody to take our dog out or to give him some meds or give him some food. But sometimes it's obviously for a much more serious situation when disaster strikes. The evacuation plan. I highly encourage you to sit down at the, the dinner table with all family members, and it doesn't matter how young or how old they are. Sometimes they say some of the um, you know, best ideas will come from the mouths of babes, and you never know. A child might come up with something or be really concerned about our animal or something else that we just 
didn't think of. So let it be fun. Don't let it be scary for anybody, but let everybody participate in planning how we would get out of each room if there was a disaster, and where would we go, and what are the instructions. Um, you will see here, obviously, it's important to keep um, directions to your evacuation route near your telephone. And again, you may laugh at me, but I think it's also important to keep directions to your own house near your telephone. Because sometimes when something happens, um, again, you know, brain cells fly out our ears, and we're not going to be thinking super clearly. And if we're having to give somebody directions on how to get to us, and we can't think, you know, which way it is, or which freeway exit, or what, um, you know, it, it really gets frustrating for them as well as us. So keep things written down neatly, and it'll just give you that peace of mind. And then, of course, always have your gas tank at least half full because you never know in the dark of night or on a weekend when you might have to evacuate. But talk this through um, and make sure that everybody in your family is able to evacuate all of your pets. Now, I know your two-year-old may not be able to take your great big senior Great Dane out the door yet, but my point is your two-year-old wouldn't be caught home alone with that pet anyway. So anybody that's ever home alone needs to know how to handle all of the pets because, again, disasters aren't predictable and we don't know who's going to be where when something happens. Also, you'll see in that second bullet point I have underlined Make sure that your animals are on record with um, your landlord if you happen to live in an apartment and that they can evacuate via the stairwell. Uh, this may sound goofy, but you know a lot of dogs um, don't do stairs very well. And if they don't, especially if they're seniors and they have arthritis or hip dysplasia or ACL problems or anything along those lines, you might need a way to either carry them over your shoulders or on some type of stretcher or with a back end harness. There are so many um, products out there these days that can really help our senior dogs live a longer, happier life with us and you know, and giving them a quality of life. So investigate these products and make sure you have them on hand, but that you use them before you need them so that once again it isn't something new and scary when we've already got the energy going and our pets are, you know, picking up on it and they're nervous. Um, a great example is muzzling. I know a lot of us never want to muzzle our pet, but in pet first aid classes, I always teach people different ways to muzzle an animal and tell them to go home and practice it. Put the muzzle on, take it off, give the dog a treat, and then forget about it for weeks and try it again. But the idea is when anything becomes familiar, it's less scary. And you don't want the first time for a muzzle to go on be, to be the same time your pet has a, you know, a painful cut to his paw because then you're giving him a double whammy and increasing his stress. Always do these things ahead of time and let them get you know, used to things so they aren't scary. Also part of that evacuation plan isn't just getting the heck out of Dodge, but it's where is the family going to go? And you need to have a primary place as well as some secondary ones cited upon um, so that all family members can meet up there with the pets just in case you don't all happen to be get together when that earthquake, that fire, that hurricane strikes. Do know that most Red Cross shelters will not accept pets for health reasons. You know, it's very likely at a Red Cross shelter that other people won't be, um, you know, pet savvy. They may be allergic to animals. So get yourself a list of hotels, doggy daycares, and other facilities where you can take your pets. And um, obviously, when there's an actual disaster, we're hoping that most hotels will accept our family members along with us, but you know, get family members on board or friends that are out of you know your local area to find out who you know where you can, where you guys can go where you can bring all of your family members. Here's a list again. I'm going to once again instead of reading over it because time won't allow me to go over it in detail, but you'll have access to these slides, and you need to make sure you fill in the blanks, so to speak. And for each of these bullet points here, find a local facility that applies and get their phone numbers and possibly even directions um, to their location so that you are set to go. When the time comes, though, you need to get out quickly and encourage any of your neighbors and friends to do so as well.
If you're told to evacuate by local officials, don't delay. You're putting them and other people in danger as well. If it's been deemed that it's time to get out, you need to get out, but you need to get out with your pets. So at the first sign of any emergency, if you have felines in the family or small dogs, gather them up in crates so that you're not um, running around trying to catch them at the last moment. Bring dogs in the house. Um, it's possible to even have their leashes and harnesses already on being a really good idea so that when you do have to go, you are ready. Um, follow instructions. Take your emergency supplies. And it's a good idea to just leave a note um, saying where you're going, but hopefully your out-of-state or other emergency contacts um, already know that because if you have a disaster plan written, and my book, The Pet Safety Crusader's Guide to Pet Disaster Paw Preparedness, which will be out at the end of September, um, will have a whole template for you, and it will remind you of all these things you need to do. Plan, prepare, and practice. That's what it's all about. Planning ahead. And once you have that plan, you have to make sure that everybody's prepared, that everyone has read it, and everyone knows what to do. And then you need to practice it. Literally have those drills like we used to have in elementary school a couple of times a year where everybody had to proceed in an orderly fashion and in a single um, file line out to the parking lot or wherever that happened to be. Do this with your family members and don't forget your dogs, any other pets as well too, but make sure that everybody is taking the animals out. Once again, it becomes um, rote for them and there's just no way to learn anything other than actually doing it. And if any of you happen to be fans of the Big Bang Theory, um, Sheldon Cooper once um, tried to learn to swim on his dining room table, which was a big joke. But my point is that you can't just set it and forget it. You have to practice it and you have to actually walk through it like so many things in life. This practice could end up being a lifesaver for your family. And my third point now, um, we're, we're prepared, we gathered our supplies, we written our evacuation plan and we practice it regularly, which regularly can mean twice a year, or maybe you want to do it at every seasonal change just make to make sure it's fresh in your minds as well as your pets. Because you can't talk your pets through it. So by getting them on a leash and evacuating, they're understanding what's going on. Well, now the third component is what do you need to have um, in your paw preparedness kit, what should be stashed there so that as you evacuate, you and your family members are, you know, safe and have all the things you need. Well, just like when we get on a plane and the stewardess or airline attendant tells us to put our oxygen mask on ourselves first if the worst happens before we help anybody else, the same thing applies in this instance too. We need to make sure the human needs are met or we're not going to be of any great help to our pets. So make sure you have all the foods, the medicine, the clothing, the documents um, needed so that you will be well taken care of and that in turn you can take good care of your pets. A lot of these documents, um, along with your pet's documents, should be put into a waterproof container, kind of like a Ziploc bag. But it's not a bad idea to also put them on a flash drive. And if you have a family member or a dear friend that you trust out of state, and when I say out of state, it doesn't necessarily have to be out of state, but you know, out of your city, out of the region where you know, if a disaster hits you, it may likely not hit them. It wouldn't hurt to send them a flash drive of all of these important documents just so that you know, if the worst happens, you're covered and you will have access to them. A Ziploc bag, though, is a great way to actually have the documents there printed out on paper that you might need, and I highly encourage you, besides your pet's medical records that include their vaccinations, because if you do evacuate them to a temporary animal shelter, which hopefully will be near the Red Cross Human Shelter, since it won't be part of it, um, you, you need to show that they've already had their vaccines, or otherwise the shelter staff is going to have to revaccinate them and you know we especially with our seniors or any with any health issues we don't ever want to over vaccinate um, we want to keep them safe from disease but we ne you know even too much of a good thing isn't a good thing so having that proof is great 
And then if you look at the bottom two pictures, this is my beautiful lady bonsai, my Akita, who unfortunately just passed away last month at the ripe old age of 15 plus. Um, she was a, a rescue, so we'll never know how old she is, but a lady never tells her age anyway. And she was just my true love, my heart and soulmate doggy. But if you look at the pictures there, you can see some really distinctive marks of her. On her right side, the left-hand picture, you see she kind of has a kidney bean or a kind of a you know unformed circle. And on her left side, it was truly a heart. So taking pictures of not only your pet with all of your family members proving that you belong together, but photographing your pets from different sides, showing their markings, their swirls, their different colorings, that's like a fingerprint of your pet and proves you belong together. Should, unfortunately, your pet go missing during the disaster, you have a good, clear picture right away to make flyers. But this is also a great proof when you're reunited or picking up your pet from a shelter or elsewhere that you do belong with your pet. So I know a lot of you are going to already have heartwarming photos of your pets on your phone. But during Katrina, sometimes cell phones didn't even work. So again, you know, having that printed out copy and having great pictures from different angles um, you know, a picture can truly speak a thousand words, so um, have those available. Now, if you're making up your disaster kit now, and say you have a black lab puppy, for instance, at some point he's going to get a gray muzzle and a frosted face. So make sure you do update the photos in your disaster kit as years go by, because your pets won't always look the way they do right now. They'll be just as loved and just as dear but their you know, um, expressions in their face will change. And here's my, my big list for you, my, what I call my paw paredness um, list that you're going to either put into a backpack or some kind of rolling tub or maybe even to a pet's extra crate. But it's the properly fitting materials to get them out safely, the collar, the harness, the leash, the muzzle. Um, you may even need a muzzle for a kitty if you have a senior kitty or a young kitty. A crate and a carrier is so important, but you know, so often we have these things and we never use them until we evacuate or take our pets to the vet. That's just such a disservice we're doing to our pets. Um, you need to make sure your pets are comfortable in them. So from time to time, leave it open in the living room with your pet's favorite blanket and toy, maybe some treats, and let him go in and lay down. Make sure he can absolutely stand up, turn around, and lie down in it. Even if your pet hasn't grown in size, as he becomes a senior, some of the body parts just may not work the way they did when he was younger, and it may be harder for him to get into a cramped space. Uh, and very often when we do evacuate to a shelter, pets are going to have to be in some sort of containment like a crate. So it's best if you can provide one that's comfortable for your pet and that your pet gets com comfortable and acclimated to it from time to time at home. You'll see things that are kind of no-brainers here, but I want you to have a list because it's so easy to forget things, like extra ID tags, food with an expiration date on it. Generally, I say if by the end of the year you haven't had a disaster, feed that food to your pet and put fresh in because you certainly don't during a disaster want your pets eating three-year-old food. Water, we generally count on a half a gallon for a small pet and a gallon per day for a large pet. So add that into your family's water needs. And don't forget their medications, the bowls to feed them in, the spoons and can openers if it's not a pop top, grooming supplies because they may get wet and dirty and you need to comb out those gorgeous coats, all kinds of cleanup material, species specific needs. Um, you know, for our dogs, we're going to need those scoopers or those doggy cleanup bags for kitties, disposable tray and litter and so on, and obviously something that feels good for them to lay down on. What I mean by shirt that smells like you, ha ha ha, is if we do have to evacuate our pet to a shelter and we won't be with them, it's great to put something in there that has our scent on it that's comforting to our pet. I know there are different pheromones you can buy as well and spray on things and that just might keep your pets calm in an emergency situation, but having the scent of their favorite person often is a really good thing that can help. And like I mentioned before, their medical records, pictures of your pets, you can never have enough cleanup materials, plastic bags, zip ties, and duct tape, and do not, I repeat, do not forget your pet first aid kit, but first you must know how to use all the items, 
You make sure if you use something up, you replace it. Make sure all items are within it, within their expiration date, and um, you know just practice the skills so that you really um, use the right tool basically for the right job. And then flashlight, transistor radio, and your human supplies and kit as well. So that's a really good list to get you going um, and make sure you have everything you need for your pet's sake. We've talked quite a bit about a lot of these things. Um, you know, having that crate. I honestly, I'm not a huge fan for pillowcases for cats. I'd really have you rather have you get them, you know, used to their carrier. But have sturdy collars and leashes, um, muzzles for your pet. Again, our best friend. You know, just if they're injured or hurt, they could bite us. It's going to be a stressful situation. And some places just absolutely won't let the dog come in without a muzzle on because they don't know your dog. And it's, you know, possible that in their minds that he could bite someone. And we don't want human first aid incidents to happen either. These are all the things I was telling you, so it's just a little bit more detail. So I'm glad you're going to have the luxury of going back through these slides and you know checking it all out. Food is one of those things, um, no matter which um, list you look at, they generally tell you between three days and two weeks. So I have to leave that up to you, how much you prepare for, but a minimum of three days. And I would probably plan for a minimum of a week for each pet and each human just in case. And under pet treats, I have don't switch brands. That applies to the pet food, too. I know sometimes during the summers and throughout the years, we go to these really fun pet adoption events, and there are pet food companies in there giving out samples. And a lot of people think, oh, well, these are small little packs. I'm going to stick those in my disaster kit. They're nicely wrapped up. But only do that if that is the brand of food your pet is used to. When an emergency strikes, the last thing you want to do for yourself or your pet is suddenly change their diet when we're already stressed. So just make sure the food you're stashing is what your pet's body is used to. Here's more stuff, the cleaning supplies and all I mentioned. And you'll see the stakes and tie-outs, um, an image of them in the bottom right corner. This isn't something I would normally recommend to tie out a dog anywhere. But my point is, if you're evacuating, who knows? The family might be living in a tent somewhere. And you can't have you know, your hand on the leash. I mean, we can try, but you can't have it on the leash every second. You're going to have to cook. You're going to have to clean. You're going to have to do other things. So having a really sturdy, size-appropriate tie-out for your dog, never leaving him alone um, on it, but just giving you the freedom of your hands while you're doing other things and having your senior dog near your side wherever you happen to be, that's what um, the importance of having the stake or tie out is. You also want to have your supplies stashed in several places um, in case they become unretrievable. Us here in earthquake country, if we stash stuff indoors, we always say to have it near an outside wall because if there's suddenly a lot of rubble, we don't want to have to dig through layers and layers of the house to get the important things we need. So don't put it in an interior room or down in a basement. Um, just make sure that it'll be accessible when you need it. And you might, I shouldn't say might, you definitely want to have one in your car. You may have one in a shed. If you, um, you know, work outside the home, you should have emergency supplies at home as well, just so that you're prepared and you can get to what you need and then get safely to all of your family members. Now, do realize when a disaster strikes, our pet is entirely dependent on us. They're not going to have you know, created this emergency plan and blow the whistle and call us all together to you know, get the heck out. We need to take care of them. When you have a dog or a cat, even when he's a senior, he's basically a furry toddler for life, and they depend on us. So even if you think you're going to be gone only a short time, take your pets with you. Animals that are turned loose or left behind to fend for themselves are likely to become victims of exposure, starvation, contamination, injury, any kind of you know, distress, trauma, or danger. I mentioned this earlier, but I can't say it enough, to bring pets inside the house at the first warning, whether it's an earthquake tremor or the smell of smoke. Get everybody together, two-legged, four-pod, and um, 
you know, realize your older pets are going to require more time to get into the cars and crates. So don't save everything for the last minute. Always think worst case scenario. Not to be, you know, pessimistic, but if you only think there's going to be minor damage, um, you know, it's more likely that somebody's going to get hurt or something's going to happen. Really plan like everything is the, the big thing, not just a dress rehearsal and get everybody to safety. Did I say this before? Your pets are not safe alone. They become stressed when they're, you know, housed in the house by themselves. So you can put them in a crate when you're gathering things up and getting ready to evacuate, but do not leave them home alone. And never, ever leave them behind in a crate or a carrier. During Katrina, even birds left in cages perished because people didn't realize how high the water would rise. Once we've gotten ourselves and our pets out um, and the disaster has played out, or at least seems to, because we know there can always be other aftershocks or another hurricane or tornado can come along, but when it seems like the worst is over, recovery then needs to take place. And that can be physical and emotional for both you and your senior dog. Before you let them back in the house, survey the area inside and out. Windows may have been broken, you know, beams may have come down, there can be sharp objects, things that can electrocute or cut paws or burn them. So really, you know, observe the scene carefully before you let your pets back in. Realize the fence that normally contained them in the backyard may not be existent or may not be as sturdy as it once was. So check everything out before you even attempt to let your pets back in and go back to normal. And examine them closely. Put on a fresh pair of eyeballs, so to speak, and look at your dog like you've never looked at him before, really looking for bumps and scrapes and cuts and anything caught in the fur. And if you observe any sign of illness or injury, do the appropriate first aid, but get them um, competent veterinary medical help at the first possible moment. Do realize, though, that their um, injury may not be something you see externally. There can certainly be internal bleeding from a bump or a bruise. And there's that emotional trauma um, from just having to gone through this emergency, whatever it happens to be. If for some reason your pets did escape, um, it's possible they often come home at dinner time, but there's no guarantee. And do realize if there's been a lot of rain or fire, the smells and the water may have washed away their familiar scents and landmarks, and it might confuse them and make it more difficult for them to find their way home to you. So do your best to keep them at your side the moment you notice um, that disaster is stricken. Uh, also notice that their behaviors may change. They may be physically okay, but they may be acting out. They may be less vocal. Um, they may become aggressive. So approach your senior dog carefully. Uh, remember our seniors may have some trouble hearing and don't like to be, you know, snuck up upon. Always stomp your feet or clap your hand if you're coming from behind. And um, just, you know, take extra time and care. You're going to be on edge, but once again, remember to take that deep breath and, you know, think with your heart towards your senior dog. I've already mentioned about releasing them indoors only once you know it's safe. And, you know, don't let them tank up on food and water. You absolutely want to keep them hydrated and make sure you have that good fresh water supply. But, you know, just like with us, it's probably best to do a few extra meals and small servings because everybody's tummy is going to be on edge. I love having ginger snap cookies, the um, human kind, around for my pets. Um, before car rides and just, you know, any other time. There are other forms of ginger, obviously, you can have as well, but that can settle an upset tummy. And do make sure they get their rest. We all need our rest when um, we've been through such a stressful event. Do check with animal control and post flyers everywhere. Check um, Pet Finders and Adopt-A-Pet and all the different websites out there if your pet is lost. In the case of a wildfire, in addition to the basics we've talked about today, just um, realize that it can change directions, so you need to have a secondary and maybe even a third escape route in case those flames block your path. 
Beforehand, though, do create that fire break. Um, as much as some of us may like living in the woods and amongst greenery, you really should clear away vegetation and you know from your roof and about 30 feet from all structures so that if fire breaks out, the fire department has a better chance of saving your homestead. And do monitor your pets for burns and smoke inhalation. If you haven't taken a pet first aid class, you know, the Pet Safety Crusader here can't tell you enough how important it is and to review every couple of years because if you don't use skills, you'll lose them and you want to be able to go on autopilot to help your pet. You must know how to um, perform rescue breathing and CPCR. Cardiopulmonary cerebral resuscitation is the name for the latest protocol, so don't be caught unprepared. Those of you in earthquake country, and believe it or not, just about I think every state in the U.S. can have an earthquake. I know California and some other states are more prone, but it can happen everywhere and we don't get that advanced warning, so you can't wait to the last minute. You've got to be prepared today. Be very careful about the, the new trend in catios, these outdoor enclosures for cats or any kennels that you may have for your dog or dog house, that it isn't positioned underneath things that could fall during a tremor. Another thing to add to your bolt cutter, uh, to your um, disaster kit if you live in earthquake country is a bolt cutter or wire cutters that in case you know a, a branch or something comes down on fencing or on a kennel that you can cut that animal out to safety and do know where to turn off the gas. Everybody should know that because a pipe can break um, in just about any disaster. Once again, the moment something happens or at the first sign of it, you know, confine your pets. Get them in the house and smaller pets, if you can get them into a bathroom or a carrier, it's just going to create a better situation for you for when the time comes that you actually do have to evacuate. Be prepared to handle cuts as well as the burns and the smoke inhalation um, that we talked about earlier. And, you know, splint a broken bone. Things can happen during disasters, especially if something falls during an earthquake or an animal twists a leg stepping into a hole or, you know, trying to climb over things. So know those pet first aid skills. And know the human ones too because you may need to help a human. With floods and mudslides, in addition to um, the basic ones, just remember it's always better to err on the side and evacuate early. If it turns out that it was a false alarm for any of these disasters, you and your pets have just practiced a meaningful drill. You've gotten another drill in instead of the real thing, but um, it's just better to get out and not to have ne you know, needed to. And here, as I was referring to before, you never know how high the water is going to rise, so a cat on a countertop or a bird in a cage still isn't safe. Get your senior dog out and all of his furry friends. And then when there's standing water around, we have to be so careful that our pets are washed off, that they don't groom from the diseased water, and that they don't drink it. So always have that good, fresh supply of water on hand. Um, and maybe either a filtration system or tablets. Um, I, I believe it's 17 drops of chlorine bleach to every gallon of water, and you have to let it sit about 30 minutes to an hour before you can drink it. But um, all of those things are helpful to know. So stay curious. Keep on learning. Here are some links you might want to refer to to get more information. And by preparing for the worst, you just may prevent the worst from happening. So my youngest son, Haiku, there and I are keeping paws and fingers crossed that you don't have to deal with an emergency, but if you do, that you are now better prepared. And I hope you'll check out my book, The Pet Safety Crusader's Guide to Pet Disaster Preparedness, which will be out the end of September 2016. Paws and fingers crossed for great success and much happiness with you and your pets. And thanks so much to the Gray Muzzle Organization for letting me share this material with you. Oh, thank you, Denise. That was awesome. <clears throat> thank you all for listening in and um, on this important topic and just taking an interest in this. This is great. Um, so to learn more about Denise or first aid or um, pet pod parrotness, you can go to her website at sunnydoginc.com. And to learn more about senior dogs um, and the Gray Muzzle Organization, just go to graymuzzle.org.
So thank you all again, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye now.